Well, thanks very much, and uh, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, you know, the genesis of this project, the book you can see there on the, the closest to me, the, it's called Original Six Dynasties, the Detroit Red Wings. And what it was basically is uh, just by chance, a fellow I know and my, who's a publisher and myself came to meet this fellow whose grandfather had been a photographer for the Detroit Times, which you probably remember was a long ago newspaper that folded in the 60s. But his grandfather had saved all his negatives, everything he'd ever shot for the paper pretty much. And in one box, it was all negatives of Red Wings games that he'd shot throughout his career, which spanned pretty much the whole original six era, which was from 1942 to 67. And we got this great idea, you know, why don't we put all these photos together and uh, make a book? And I thought, yeah, that's a fabulous idea, until I saw that the negatives didn't have any IDs. And uh, <laughs> the publisher said, well, hey, you're the writer, you, you figure that out. So it took a lot of painstaking process, but we'll talk about that later. And the original six is kind of a misnomer because the NHL actually started in 1917, it was an original four the Montreal Canadiens, the Toronto Arenas, the Montreal Wanderers, and the Ottawa Senators. Now, the reason the original six terminology came in was basically the 1967 expansion that doubled the league from six to 12 teams, and the six teams that had already been in the league became known as the original six, and it's kind of a, a historic moniker that's been hung on those teams forever, and there's a real tradition to playing for those teams. I remember this summer talking to Matthew Schneider when he was inducted into the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame. And he played for the Red Wings, the Leafs, and the Canadians. And he said, and he also played for teams like the Islanders and the Ducks and a few others that are far from original six. And he said, you noticed a difference when you played in Montreal, in Detroit, in Toronto. There was a different expectation of you than there was when you played on those other teams. They, the passion for hockey in those cities far outweighed the other cities that he played in and it was something that he said really struck him and uh, to this day he said you can still sense that difference and you certainly can sense it at Joe Louis Arena when the Red Wings play somebody like the Bruins compared to say the Minnesota Wild. There's definitely a different buzz in the arena. And when you talk about the original six and the Red Wings you have to talk about this guy. This guy, they call him Mr. Hockey. He certainly was that. He was definitely Mr. Red Wing. And Gordie Howe, at this moment in this photo, has just scored his 545th NHL goal in 1963. And the anniversary was just last week, in fact. He scored it against the Montreal Canadiens. It was a shorthanded goal. And he beat Rocket Richard on that day to become the all-time leading scorer in NHL history and held that title for pretty much the next four decades until that Gretzky fella came along. And uh, one of the weird coincidences, I guess you could call it, of the goal was Montreal was on the power play and Henri Richard, who was the rocket, Maurice Richard's little brother, went for a, a line change and uh, nobody came on the ice for him. So Montreal actually, even though they had a power play, all of a sudden only had four guys on the ice and Gordy took advantage of that and ended up scoring the goal. Now, this is uh, right after he scored. You can see the people applauding. You can see the attire in 1963 at the games was a little bit different than it is today. Nobody's wearing a Red Wings jersey other than the guy on the ice. And an interesting thing I noticed about the photo, if you look, I don't know if you can see it close enough, but above Gordy's number on his stick, it says lie number seven. Because back in the days of wooden sticks, a lie was how the, the blade met, the angle at which the blade met the shaft of the stick. And each player, if a guy liked to stick handle in tight, he wanted a more of a straight lie, or the guy who was a shooter would want more of an angled lie. And in those days, because the sticks were assembled in pieces, they had to know the guy's lie. Today, with the composite sticks, the whole one piece is done to that guy's specifications. It's very similar to the way they make goalie masks, where they mold it to the goalie's face. The stick is a mold is set of what the guy likes, and they pour it into that mold, and the stick is made that way. So there's no such thing as a lie on a stick anymore. But I just thought that you know an, another sign of the times that uh, certainly to see something like that on a stick, you know, a lot of young people today would know what the heck that was. Well, I started doing these talks a couple of years ago 
and I threw this photo in because the Wings were about to play the Bruins in the playoffs then. And this is a, a Detroit Boston game, and as you can see, the goalie for the Bruins is Terry Sawchuk, who most people will think of as a Red Wings goalie, but he actually did play two parts of two seasons with the Bruins in between his first and second stint as a Red Wing. That's Ted Lindsay going behind the net, and that's uh, another well-known player, Alan Stanley, who looks like he's about to wind up and chop Ted in two with his stick. Now, the reason I threw it in back then was because the fact that it was the first time the Red Wings and Bruins met in the playoffs when they met two years ago since 1957. And the reason I thought that was curious because you might remember who won the NFL championship in 1957. It was a team called the Detroit Lions. <laughs> and I thought, geez, is history going to repeat itself here? Are the Wings going to play the Bruins in the playoffs? And then the Lions are going to win the NFL title? And then they went 11-5 and five and made the playoffs and lost. <laughs> so only the Lions can spoil a coincidence like that. You know, any other team, probably they win the Super Bowl. The Lions, no. And this year we don't even want to talk about them. <laughs> now they called this fellow Terrible Ted, they called him Scarface, but whatever this fan called him that night, Ted didn't like it very much because if you look very closely you can just see part of his number seven as he is already in the crowd uh, confronting a spectator who had uh, badmouthed him. And Terry Sachuk seems pretty intent on joining in the fray, you know, even though he's got goal pads on, he's halfway over the fence as well. Glenn Scove seems a little, uh, he's number 12, he seems a little, well, do I want to do this or not? You know, it's kind of like that moment in Slapshot when the Hanson brothers go up in the crowd and the other team, one of the guys says, yeah, should we get into this? And the guy gives him a dirty look, he says, just a thought. <laughs> anyway, uh, this happened and uh, a fan, I, said something nasty to Ted and Ted went after him and just to show you how different society was in the 50s compared to today, they were able to work out their differences and there was no charges laid, no lawsuits or any of that. You know, today's litigious society, if a player went in the crowd after a player, it cost him millions of dollars, even if he never hit anybody. Again, you can see the fans all decked out in their suits. Those two guys in the back seem to be really enjoying <laughs> the view they're getting of the scrap. I don't know why the woman's wearing sunglasses, but maybe she didn't want anybody to know she was there. And of course, the chicken wire, I mean, you can't talk about the original six without talking about chicken wire, and you know, it was a goalie's nightmare because, speaking as an ex-goaltender myself, I, who played when, in the chicken wire era, when they shot the puck into the corner, it could go anywhere because there was no, it wasn't like glass where there was gonna be a, you know, a physics and angle involved, depending on how it hit into the chicken wire, it could go left, it could go right in front of the net. So a goalie couldn't, wouldn't dare come out and play the puck in a chicken wire rink because he'd end up going this way and the puck would go that way and it'd be in his net. So I'm sure from a, the goaltenders union was very, very pleased to see the introduction of plexiglass which came in in the early to mid 50s. But to think about it, before they had this, there was nothing. So if you were at a front row ticket to an NHL game, you were literally could reach out and touch the players if you chose to. And that meant the puck could very easily reach out and touch you. So you, you really had to pay attention. You know, no, nobody would have been checking their phones in those days in the middle of the game because the next thing they know, they'd be checking out where to see the local dentist. Now this is, uh, the production line of course originally was Sid Abel, Gordie Howe and Ted Lindsay. But after Abel left in 1952 they tried a number of different centers. I think they went through seven the first year without Abel. And they finally settled on Alex Del Vecchio. That's him on the, the far side, Gordie in the middle and Ted on this side. And this was a, a publicity shot that was set up. And it was early in Del Vecchio's career. If you know Alex at all, he loves his stogies nowadays, but back then he didn't smoke, and in fact, none of them smoked. So they wanted to set up this photo with all three of them lighting a cigar, and they didn't have any cigars. But luckily, Bud Lynch, who was the Red Wings play-by-play -play man in those days, smoked cigars all the time. So Bud Lynch supplied the cigars for this photo. So it's kind of, you know, people, I'm sure in today's uh, politically correct society, he'd never have a player have his picture taken smoking anything. Because the funny thing is, back in the 20s, NHL players used to do ads for cigarettes. 
And nowadays, you know, they're, they're so obsessed with uh, fitness and staying in shape and, you know, with the money they make, who can blame them? You know, I'd want to play as long as I could too. But in those days, there were several players who smoked and it wasn't looked upon as an issue really. I mean, most teams had a room off the dressing room where the players could go have a smoke between periods. And, you know, to think about that today, I mean, that's just bizarre. It just shows you, like, people talk about how the players are faster and all that. I mean, a lot of it has to do with nutrition and conditioning and diet and just knowing more about the science of the body than they did in those days. I mean, and these guys all had jobs in the, the summer because they didn't make, they made more money than the average person, but they didn't make outrageous money like they do today. So these guys had to work in the summer and most of them had regular type jobs. I mean, Ted Lindsay ended up starting an auto parts company. Uh, Gordy Howe did a lot of off uh, season work for Sears. And all the other guys had different jobs. And back in the day, they would do, you know, Kyle Gardner drove a beer truck in the summer. Can you imagine working in a restaurant and an NHL player is delivering your beer? <laughs> Speaking of technology, here's how they kept track of uh, the players in the system back in the, the, the late 50s. This is the... Uh, Second day that Sid Abel was on the job as coach of the Red Wings after he'd been hired in the January of 1958. And he's pointing out, uh, apparently he's very fond of Len Lundy, who you can see there has 20 goals and 20 assists and 40 points. Now these would be every professional the Wings had in their system and what their totals were for the year. And they would write them, as you can see, on a chalkboard and erase them. So if you know, somebody in the organization didn't like a player, he could sneak in at night and change his numbers. Today, if you go into Ken Holland's office, it's all on a laptop. He can with a push one button and tell you where every player is. The guy's in Europe, the guy's in junior, the guy's in college, the guy's in the minors. He knows in an instant what they're all doing. And in those days, they really relied on uh, having uh, people, like boots on the ground, so to speak, because you know there was no uh, television for very little other than the NHL. You didn't see many games on TV. And if you wanted to see, like, a great story is how they found Marcel Pronovo. They were, they would often, they would have a few area scouts and they would network with arena managers in their area and, you know, kick the guy a few bucks and say, you know, if you see somebody that looks like they got something, give me a shout before you call anybody else. And uh, the guy who ran the arena in Shawinigan had, Quebec, had called the Red Wings Quebec scout and said the Wilson brothers who were playing then in Shawinigan, Johnny and Larry, he said, you should come check these guys out. So the scout drove up to Shawinigan to see them play one afternoon on a Saturday, and they both played quite well, and he approached them after the game about signing with the Red Wings. And they said to him, yeah, we'd be interested, but if you really want to see a hockey player, you should come see the team we play with tonight. We got a defenseman on that team who's unbelievable. And the scout went, and that guy was Marcel Pronovo, who ended up in the Hockey Hall of Fame. So, you know, Johnny Wilson had an okay NHL career. Larry didn't have much of an NHL career, and the guy that they weren't even looking for ended up in the Hall of Fame. So that just shows you how inexact scouting was in those days. I mean, another great story is Gordy Howe. He went to the Rangers camp when he was 15, and they sent him home. I mean, the best hockey player probably ever played. They had him there for four days and said, yeah, kid, in fact, Lester Patrick told him he should probably look into another line of work because I don't think you're going to make it in hockey. And this is Lester Patrick. And the irony of that is, in the 60s, the first winner of the Lester Patrick Trophy for service to hockey in the United States was Gordie Howe. <laughs> so it was a lot different. Today, there's so many scouts out there, nobody gets missed. I don't care where you are, they're going to find you. And uh, there's no, there may still be late bloomers and diamonds in the rough, but there's nobody that comes out of nowhere anymore to play. Everybody's known now. There's the amount of paperwork that goes into scouting now and the amount of money they spend on it. You know, they, they go to Europe, you know, they spend weeks and weeks in Russia and places like that. You know, Jim Neal used to talk about when he was the Wings assistant GM, he called them his Dr. Zhivago trips. He would make to these small towns in Russia where sometimes the only way to get there would be by a horse-drawn sleigh because there'd be so much snow you couldn't travel on the roads.
Now this is an interesting photo because, as you can see, it looks like the referee Bill Chadwick got the worst of this altercation. He's bleeding over the eye. But the funny thing is the guy he's holding back in the Red Wing sweater is Red Kelly. Red Kelly won the Lady Bing Trophy for gentlemanly play three times. He's the second defenseman to win it. In fact, up until Brian Campbell a few years ago, there'd only been two defensemen to win it, and they were both Red Wings. Bill Quackenbush, who actually played an entire season without taking a penalty on defense, which is just astonishing to think that, uh, especially in the six-team NHL where you'd play each team 14 times, you got to think there was a little bit of animosity there when you're saying the same guy that many times. I mean, if you played them in a best of seven playoff series, you could play the same guy 21 times in a one season. I mean, you could learn to hate a guy real fast if you had to bump into him 21 times a year. But Kelly here is accosting Ron Stewart of the Leafs, and uh, he had a few fights for a guy that, for a guy who won Lady Bing trophies, he wasn't known as a soft player. Kelly was not afraid to mix it up. He played a tough game. He just played it clean. I mean, you, can, you can hit hard and play physical hockey and not be dirty and not take penalties. I mean, a guy who should have won, I think, multiple Lady Bing trophies is Nick Lidstrom. I mean, nobody played defense positionally better than him, maybe in the history of the game. And he didn't get penalties because he was always in the right spot. Because generally a defenseman gets a penalty because they're out of position and they got to hook a guy or you know, slash him or something to slow him down because they've got caught flat-footed. And Lindstrom just never did, so that's why he never had to take penalties. And Kelly was the same type of player. And Kelly was a guy, he was so versatile that when the Wings traded him to Toronto, Punch Imlach played him at center. And he ended up, uh, he won four Stanley Cups as a defenseman and four Stanley Cups as a center. He's the only guy to win that many Stanley Cups and never play for the Canadians. Here we see Kelly again, and uh, this is after a game, and he's accommodating some very happy youngsters with some autographs. Now, what's interesting about this photo is at Olympia Stadium, when Jack Adams ran the Red Wings, he determined that the players should always enter and leave the building, both before and after the game and between periods, walking through the fans. Because his theory was if they had to look the fans in the eye, they would be accountable. They wouldn't allow themselves to go on long losing streaks because they'd be too embarrassed to walk by the fans and they'd certainly hear about it if they weren't playing well. So his theory was, and win or lose, these guys had to come out of that room and greet these fans and be gentlemen about it. Whether, you know, if they just lost nine to one, they still had to go out there. And uh, he always felt that the people they had to be accountable to first were the people that were buying the tickets. And uh, that was a great way to do it. Nowadays, you look at the tunnels they come out and they have special entrances for them. I mean, I've seen the design for the new arena and they're actually going to have a tunnel from the parking garage into the rink so the players will never have to go outside from when they arrive to get into the arena and when they go home. So, you know, and people won't even get a glimpse of them other than when they're on the ice. So it's really changed from uh, what it was then to what it is now. But, you know, I, that's again speaks to the what I said earlier, these guys didn't make the kind of money that made them, you know, set for life like players are today. And I think they were more like regular folk in those days. And, you know, having covered the Red Wings as long as I have, I've seen that dynamic change in the dressing room where when I first started out, yeah, they made good money in the late 80s, early 90s, but they didn't make ridiculously, you know, the amounts they make now, like, you know, the average guy's getting a million dollars. So they're still, they knew what a mortgage was, they knew what a car payment was. These guys today, they see something, they buy it. And when one guy told me the best thing about it is what the money they make, I see something, I don't have to look at the price tag, I just say, yeah, I'll take it. Now the Red Wings actually had three Hall of Fame goalies during the 1950s, and you think, I think, before the two goalie system came in in the six-team NHL, the toughest job to get and maintain was NHL goaltender. There were six of them. And you think six goalies in the world. You look at a guy like Johnny Bauer, who was all of fame goalie, one of the best that ever played. He didn't make it in the NHL as a regular until he was 33. And it wasn't because he was a bad goalie. It was because there was only six jobs. And once you had one, you didn't want to give it up. 
And when I mentioned earlier they traded Terry Sawchuk to Boston, it was because they had Glenn Hall, another Hall of Fame goalie. And for two years, the Glenn Hall was the Red Wing goalie. And in those two years, one season he posted 12 shutouts, which is still the single season record for the team. And the other season he won the Calder Trophy as the top rookie in the NHL. So you can't really say that uh, he played poorly. It wasn't why they got rid of him. I mean, they really, the reason they traded Glenn Hall was when Ted Lindsay started uh, to try to begin the NHL Players Association in 1957, one of his staunch supporters was Glenn Hall. So when they shipped uh, Lindsay to Chicago as punishment, because Chicago was considered NHL Siberia in those days because they never made the playoffs, they sent Hall along with him. And uh, I'm sure the Blackhawks sent them a thank you card in 1961 when Hall led them to the Stanley Cup, beating the Red Wings in the final. Another thing that became commonplace in the original six era that was rarely seen prior to it was the goalie mask. And here you see two of the Red Wings goalies, that's Sawchuk and Dennis Riggin is the one that's got the kind of what, what they used to call the pretzel mask on. They were the two Detroit goalies in 1962 when the masks first started to get experimented with. And these were prototypes that were actually made by Lefty Wilson, who was the Wings trainer and was a himself a former minor league goalie and if you know the history of the NHL when they had we mentioned one goalie per team there was no backup it was the responsibility of the home team to have what the league termed a capable backup goalie on standby if either goalie got hurt and could not continue and in Detroit it was Lefty Wilson so Lefty actually played in three games and two of them he played against the Red Wings and in one of them he beat them so he was <laughs> How do you go to work the next day and look Jack Adams in the eye after you just beat him? <laughs> but that was the way it worked in those days. And it really, if it weren't for television, in 1965, when games started to be were regularly televised and they were on national TV, and they just said, look, we're not holding up a program for 20 minutes while you stitch the goalie up. So you dress another goalie. And that's when it started because they didn't want to sit around. They, they would literally sit around for 20, 30 minutes, put stitches in the goalie, and send them back in the net. Pull, and goalies would get teeth pulled and go back into the net. And there was a famous Charlie Rayner who played goal for the Rangers. He said uh, he got hit in the mouth with a puck in a game and knocked out a bunch of teeth, cut them open. They stitched him up. He went back in, finished the game, played the next night, got hit in the mouth again. And they had to go in and take out some more teeth and stitch him up again. And allegedly, while he was laying on the doctor's table, he said, you know, it's amazing someone doesn't get seriously hurt in this game. Now, Dennis Riggin, interestingly, had to wear a mask. He suffered an eye injury in the minor leagues playing in Detroit's farm team in Edmonton. And so he was, had no choice. If he wanted to continue to try and play because of the eye injury he'd suffered, he had to wear a goalie mask. And as it turned out, even with the mask, he never could, his sight never came back fully enough that he could um, make it back again as a regular. And he ended up giving up the game at a young age. But, you might remember his son, Pat Riggin, was a goalie in the NHL in the 80s, and they were one of the first father and son combinations in the league who were both goalies. Now, Sawchuk was the first goalie to wear a mask for the Red Wings in a game, and uh, there's a great story about that, but I'll save it for later because i got another photo to show you about it. Here's the guy we were just talking about, Lefty Wilson, and again, uh, the technology of today where they have several doctors on standby at every game. They usually sit right behind the bench and uh, if you watch when a player comes off that's hurt or cut, you usually see someone in a suit right behind the bench. If you watch closely, get up and head down to the dressing room with them. Well, that's one of the team doctors. And uh, in this day and age, though, the trainer stitched you up. No. I don't know what kind of qualifications Lefty Wilson had to stitch anybody, but here he's stitching up Bill Gadsby, and uh, Gadsby doesn't look too concerned about it. The players just wanted to get back on the ice as fast as possible, because like we said, you know, six teams, as my, everybody feared for their job. There was no guaranteed contracts there. You know, there was no going through waivers like today. They could send you down tomorrow, and you might never come up again. So every player, you know, unless you were at Gordie Howe or Bobby Hull or the Rocket, pretty much every player in the league was fearful of missing a few games and having some kid come in and play really well and then you'd be out of a job. So they would be happy to have the trainer stitch them up if it meant they were going to get back on the ice faster. 
Uh, the other interesting thing about stitches, back in the day, there was an insurance company that sold stitch policies. Now, the way it worked was you got paid $5 for every stitch you got during the season. So there'd be the type of, and I've heard this from more than one player, the conversation in the dressing would be, how many is it going to take, doc? And the doctor would say, five. Yeah, you think you could squeeze seven in? <laughs> As I mentioned at the start, none of these photos had IDs on them. So I had to figure out who was in a lot of the photos. And I, luckily, the internet, you know, you can access rosters from every season with new uniform numbers. And by simple process of elimination, you could pretty much figure out what season the pitcher was based on who was in it and what number they were wearing and who they were playing for. But this one, I looked at it right away and I said, there's got to be a great story in this photo. Terry Sanchuk is bending over to pick up a bowler hat off the ice. And the crowd's pretty happy, as you can see. So obviously, somebody's just scored. And I just started digging, and I came across on New Year's Eve, which you know, is the Red Wings night. They always play on New Year's Eve. The Red Wings beat the Leafs 4-2 to in 1961, by the way, and Gordie Howe scored a hat trick. And I guess you know, fans, New Year's Eve, were dressed to the nines because a lot of them were probably going to parties afterward. And some guy, obviously, who was wearing his bowler hat got a little carried away when Howe scored the hat trick and rifled it on the ice. So Sacek skated over and put it on and played goal for a while wearing a bowler hat. <laughs> now if you look closely at this photo, you'll see the guy taking the draw for Montreal is Jean Beliveau, and the guy taking the draw for Detroit is Marcel Pronovo. And you, we talked about him earlier. He's a defenseman. When was the last time you saw a defenseman take a face off? Now, the reason why they did this, I've asked a few of the guys from that era about it, is all the teams did it. Toronto would use Tim Horton and Alan Stanley to take faceoffs. They did it in the defensive zone. As you can see, there's number 10, Del Vecchio, the center, filling Pronovo's spot on defense. The thinking was the defensemen were the strongest players on the ice. And on a defensive zone faceoff, your only objective was not to lose the draw. If you could tie the draw, and as you can see, Len Lundy's bursting in from the side. The idea was Pronobo was just going to tie up Beliveau and not let him get the puck back to his players, and Lundy would come in and scoop up the puck and be off with it. So the thinking was by using a big, strong defenseman, and nine times out of ten, they'd be easily able to outmuscle a forward. Obviously, Beliveau was one of the biggest forwards in the game, so that would have been a real challenge. But most of your forwards were smaller than the defensemen in that era. Uh, another funny story about this, uh, Gordie Howe told me that uh, he, and he didn't care much for Bert Olmsted, who was a uh, irascible cuss who played for the Canadians, and, and I met him, and uh, he still is an irascible cuss. But Gordie had a bone to pick with Olmsted, and he decided this was the night he wanted to settle it. They were playing the Canadians, and Pronovo was moving in to take the draw against Olmsted. And Gordie said, look, just hold him up, and when you hear me coming, get out of the way. So Gordy would have been lined up in the same spot Len Lundy was. And as soon as the puck hit the ice, Gordy came in full steam. But what happened was Olmsted pulled back and Pronovo went forward. So Gordy ran full bore into Pronovo. And Gordy suffered a fractured collarbone. And he said it was the hardest he'd ever been hit. And it was running into his own teammate. I mentioned the Sachuk and the mask. Here's the, the interesting story. If you look closely at this photo, that's a Red Wing on a breakaway against Chicago. It's Glenn Hall in goal, and the Red Wing on the breakaway is a fellow named Claude LaForge, who was a minor league forward who was called up from Hershey in uh, December 28, 1961. He was going to play at the Olympia against the Blackhawks. The problem being, in his last game in Hershey, LaForge got hit in the face with a puck and shattered his cheekbone. So uh, when they told him they were going to call him up, he said, well, I'm going. I'm playing. And what Lefty Wilson did, and as you can sort of see the straps, you can't really make out the mask, but he's wearing a goalie mask. He wore, for facial protection that night, wore a goalie mask on the ice the whole game and actually scored a goal in a 2-2 tie. And there's a great photo. You know, this was probably the same sequence, but I've seen it earlier. 
LaForge is breaking in the clear, wearing a goalie mask, and Glenn Hall, the goalie ready to stop him, isn't. <laughs> and what made this historic was that was the first game in Red Wings history where a player wore a goalie mask. So they're the only franchise that can say the first guy to wear a goalie mask for them in a game wasn't a goalie. It wasn't until the following season that Sawchuk decided to wear a mask and put one on. So this is a, a historic moment here in Claude LaForge's claim to fame when uh, someone asks you who is the first Red Wing to wear a goalie mask and they tell you Sawchuk and you say, no, it's Claude LaForge. Well, this is Bob Goldham, who is considered the, uh, the father of the shot block. You know, you look at how many shots are blocked in a game today. It's a huge strategy, especially on the penalty kill. He was really the first guy that turned it into an art form, who actually, you know, would drop, knew how to time it, to drop to one knee, to take it off the shin pad, and not really get hurt too much by it. And it, he taught it to all the Detroit defensemen. And uh, another guy who probably ascended to the throne after Goldham gave up the game was Al Arbor who started his NHL career in Detroit and most people remember him as the coach of the Islanders but he played for a long time in the NHL. He won Stanley Cups in Detroit, Chicago and Toronto and uh, was a guy that talent wise probably wasn't good enough to be a top four defenseman in the original sixth era and finally made it as a full-time regular in St. Louis when they expanded but played on, you know, it was usually the fifth defenseman on his team, so he didn't play a lot, but he was a valuable guy for the penalty kill and for, you know, late in the game defending a lead because he was such a fantastic shot blocker. Now, you might think that this happened when he was trying to block a shot. As you can see, his face is pretty much a mess. But in reality, again, this is another photo I had to do a lot of digging on to find out what's going on here. In a game against Chicago at Chicago Stadium on February 9th, 1951, he was kicked in the face, or sorry, he was hit in the face with a puck. It wasn't a shot. No, sorry, he didn't block a shot. Let me correct myself. He was kicked in the face with a skate. So that's, you know, you see how close that came to his eye. That would have been, uh, if that hit him in the eye, it would have been the end of his career because NHL rules do not allow you to play unless you have vision in both your eyes. But as bad as it looks, it's only 15 stitches. You know, you think about, you know, maybe you remember the game when Gerard Gallant accidentally kicked Salming in the face in Detroit and Salming had a road map on his face, it looked like railway tracks. I think he had 115 stitches it took to close his face. But that's again technology. The modern skate is so much sharper than the skates were in that era. You, you get cut today with a skate and you're going to take a lot of stitches. Like, we saw it last year with uh, Drew Miller got a skate in the face and he took quite a few stitches. Not a hundred, but certainly a lot. Still, I think in any area you wouldn't want to get kicked in the face with a skate. Well, this is quite possibly the most controversial goal ever scored against the Red Wings in the history of the franchise. This was game six of the 1966 Stanley Cup final and they're in overtime, and the Canadians are leading the series three games to two. And if you see that arrow, it's pointing at the puck under Henri Richard's armpit. He's all tangled up with Gary Bergman, and Roger Crozier is down, and what happened was everybody piled into Crozier, and the puck ended up in the net. Now, I, I had the f fortune to talk to Bergman about this play before he passed away, and he said, well, I know he didn't shoot it in because I'm holding on to his stick. And Bill Gadsby, who was also on that team, had a great line when we talked about it. He said, you know, if we'd have had replay in that day, we'd still be playing. <laughs> now, Henri Richard, to this day, claims that it just, he didn't even know it went in. He slid into Crozier, they piled up, and then he got up, and all the players started mobbing him, and he, at first, didn't know what was going on, and then he finally realized the puck was in the net. So he says, I never pushed it in. It just went in on its own, so... You know, what else is he going to say? Yeah, you know, it's probably the most controversial Stanley Cup winning goal until the Brett Hall foot in the crease goal in the Buffalo Dallas series in 99. But uh, another funny, I don't know if it was funny at the time, but it's kind of odd that Crozier won the Conn Smythe Trophy that year. It was the second year they had presented the Conn Smythe Trophy for the playoff MVP. And it was the first time the losing team player had got it. And after they shook hands, 
Crozier went to the dressing room and he had his gear off and he was getting ready to go in the shower and they didn't announce the Conn Smythe Trophy winner until then. So somebody from the NHL comes into Detroit's dressing room. He's just lost the Stanley Cup. The, guy, the kid's devastated. It was only his second season in the league. And they say, yeah, you got to put all your gear back on and come out and get the Conn Smythe Trophy. So at first Crozier didn't want to do it, but they finally told him, yeah, you got to do it because it's for TV and it'll look bad if you don't come out. And he finally did it. He put all his gear back on and went out on the ice and got the Conn Smythe Trophy and came back in. And he was the first one uh, to ever win it from a losing team, which just tells you how well he must have played in the playoffs if they lost and people still thought he was the best player. And with the talk of uh, the new arena coming in 2017, here was the Detroit's home for the longest tenure of any home they've had. Uh, Detroit holds a unique uh, place in uh, North American professional sports because when the franchise was awarded in 1926, they didn't have an arena. Now, unheard of today, you'd never get a, an NHL franchise if you didn't have a rink. And uh, they ended up playing the whole first season in Windsor, Ontario at the Windsor Arena, which is still there. It's not being used for hockey at the moment, but the structure is still there. And uh, it's amazing to think that a team played its entire home schedule in a foreign country. Now, granted, it's not that far to go, but still, you know, it's another country. So even though they were called the Detroit Cougars, they played all their games in Windsor. They never played a single game in Detroit their first season in the league. And Olympia opened it was supposed to be ready midway through the 26-27 season, but they fell behind schedule and didn't open until the fall of 1927. So the first game played there was the Ottawa Senators and Detroit Cougars, and Ottawa won it 2-1. to one. And uh, Johnny Shepard scored the first goal for Detroit at Olympia Stadium, which gives him two claims to fame, because his other is that he was the first Detroit player to wear number nine. So. Somebody else wore it much more famously than him. Now, it, this isn't a happy note to tell Red Wings fans since a new arena is coming up fast, but they've opened three new rinks, Windsor Arena, Olympia Stadium, and Joe Louis Arena, and they lost the first game in all three of them. So if you're a betting man and when they open the new rink and you, you, you believe in uh, trends and omens, you, you might want to bet against the Red Wings that night. Another kind of funny thing about this, this is photo was taken in the 63 Stanley Cup Finals between Toronto and Detroit. You can see that on the top of the, the board there. But if you look, you probably can't read it because it's too far away. But if you look right down toward the, the bottom, it says, on upcoming event, wrestling, Dick the Bruiser versus Alex Karras. <laughs> now that was the year that Karras was suspended from the NFL for betting on games. So I guess he had to find a way to make a living, and uh, he found it in the, the squared circle. Here we see the wings with the Stanley Cup in 1954, sorry, 1955. And uh, there's a few interesting things to note here. One is that the cup's on a table that looks like they found it in the basement. <laughs> it's not exactly glamorous, and they're just putting their hand on it for the photo. You know, nowadays, the first thing they do is grab it and carry it around the ice. But in those days, they were, for the most part, respectful of the cup, and they just, nobody wanted to be the one to kind of lift it up or anything. The other interesting thing about the photo is you see a woman right in the middle of it. And that woman is Marguerite Norris. And she was actually president of the Red Wings then. And she is the first woman to ever get her name on the Stanley Cup and for a long time was the only woman to have her name on the Stanley Cup. There's been more recently, of course, Marion Illich has got her name on it now four times, and uh, there was a woman that was part of the Avalanche's front office who got her name on the Cup, and there's also a woman who was part owner of the Flames. So there's only been four of them, and she was the first one, and uh, she was legitimately running the team. You know, Martha Ford supposedly running the Lions right now, but. Apparently, she did a really good job. I've done a lot of research into her. I thought maybe she took over when her father, James Norris, died and ran the team for two years, and they won the cup both years. And then she got married and decided that she didn't want the day-to-day -day, uh, hassle of taking care of a hockey team and turned it over to this fella, 
And you can see just over Bob Golden's shoulder, that's Bruce Norris, who was the man who was chiefly responsible for the Dead Wings era and the demise of the team. Uh, a man who was a horrible alcoholic and uh, really drank away his fortune and uh, drank away the fortunes of the Red Wings, you could argue, because once he took over, you know, they, they say this is the 55 Cup, he took over the next season and they didn't win for 42 years, so he played a role in the, the demise of the franchise. I always say there's two significant moments in the history of this franchise. So one I call survival and one I call revival. Survival was when James Norris bought the team in 1932. They were known as the Detroit Falcons. He had played, he was from Montreal, he had played for the Montreal Amateur Athletic Association, who were the first team ever to win the Stanley Cup. And their logo was a winged wheel. Their wheel went, there was a wheel and the wings came up out of it. So what he did was he turned the wheel to the side with one wing coming out of it. And that's where the Red Wings logo comes from, from de derivative of the Montreal Amateur Athletic Association logo and because Norris was a member of that and because he thought the connection of being the first Stanley Cup team and he wanted, his goal was to turn the Red Wings into a team that would be feared by everyone and he did. And you look at the Wings prior to Norris, that was the Depression era, nobody had any money there's a famous line from Jack Adams that Howie Morenz was the greatest player in the game back then, and he said, if I had, they offered me Howie Morenz for a buck 99, I wouldn't have enough money to buy him. They would, uh, the Wings, Adams would literally walk the streets during the Depression on game day and try to convince people to buy tickets. He would, uh, they had a, a spare goalie by the name of Porky Levine that uh, they needed money and there was a f minor league team in Seattle that needed a goalie, so they sold his contract to Seattle, but they didn't have any more money to buy a, bring in another goalie. So what they did was they took a piece of plywood, cut it out in the shape of a goalie, and nailed all of the, the spare equipment to it. And they would push that into the net and practice, and that was the other goalie. So it was kind of like, you know, when they put the, what do they call it, the shooter tutor that they put in the net sometimes when there's no goalie. So there was, think of an NHL team that couldn't afford to have a second goalie. So I, until Norris came along, who was, had made literally close to a billion dollars in the grain industry. So now all of a sudden, uh, I think the first thing he did was buy the Wings, an entire farm team of players. And a lot of those guys ended up playing for the Wings. And you know, they, he took the team over in 32 and in the second season of his ownership, they made the Stanley Cup Finals for the first time. And then two years after that, they won it two years in a row. They became the first American franchise to ever win back-to-back -back Stanley Cups. And I believe to this day are the only American franchise to win back-to-back -back Stanley Cups and finished first overall in the league both seasons, which is quite an accomplishment for a team that, you know, and another reason the original six came around was the league had grown to 10 teams at one point, but the depression just crushed as it did in every industry and four of the teams folded and the Red Wings came very, well, they were the Falcons, but they came perilously close to folding. And another team that almost went under that people don't realize was the Montreal Canadiens. At one point, it looked like they were gonna be sold to Cleveland interests and moved to Cleveland, but the sale fell through and, you know, imagine the Cleveland Canadians, it just doesn't have the same ring. And there's a lot of great stories of uh, guys who briefly shine in the spotlight. You know, we've talked a lot about, you know, teams only having one goalie. Well, in the playoffs, they would bring up a minor league goalie and he would travel with the team and practice with them and he was the emergency goalie, and if something happened, he played. And this fella in goal, his name is Bob Shampoo. He was Detroit's goalie in Memphis of the Central League. They had brought him along to be the practice goalie and the emergency goalie in the playoffs in 1964. And wouldn't you know it, Terry Sacha got a pinched nerve in his shoulder and couldn't play in game two of the series. So Shampoo was told, you're playing. And of course, he was terrified. He'd never played a game. He, he hadn't even played in the American League. He, the Central League was below the American League, so he was like two leagues below the NHL, and all of a sudden he's playing in the Stanley Cup playoffs, so I'd probably be terrified too. But he said uh, what got him through it was just before the opening faceoff, over to him skated Gordie Howe, and just said, don't worry about it, kid. Just do your best. 
And he said it just relaxed him. He just thought, you know, the greatest player in the world isn't worried about it. Why should I be worried about it? And they ended up winning six to four. And uh, that was the only time he ever played for the Red Wings. He never played another game. In fact, didn't play another game in the NHL until 1972 when he was with the California Golden Seals. So basically went a decade between games in the NHL. And uh, the next game, Sawchuk, who spent uh, the entire day of this game in traction and the next day in traction, the morning of game three, checked himself out of the hospital, came to the rink, played, shut the Hawks out 3 nothing, went back to the hospital and they put him back in traction. <laughs> but again, that's what these guys would do because I'm sure when Sachuk saw this guy win, he thought, I better get back in there fast. <laughs> now here's a shot of one of the most famous goals in hockey history, let alone Red Wing history. You can't see the guy who scored it, Pete Babando. This is game seven. 1950 Stanley Cup final between Detroit and the Rangers, second overtime period. Babando, they, they won the faceoff. George G., who's the closest to the goalie there, Charlie Rayner, he won the faceoff. That's Jerry Couture, one of his other line mate. And then the stick you can just see by Couture's leg, that's Pete Babando, who they won the draw back to him and he snapped a shot. And as you can see on the expression on Charlie Rayner's face, it's going past him into the net. And it hasn't obviously got there yet because no one's elated. The fans are still kind of tense. So it's obviously on the way in the net, but hasn't gone in. But this was the first time and to this day, the only time in the history of the Stanley Cup that the series was decided in double overtime of game seven. In fact, it's only been decided in overtime of game seven twice. And the other time was in 1954. And again, the Red Wings won beating Montreal. Tony Leswick was the goal scorer then, but that was in early in the first overtime. So this Babando became famous, and he's still around, and people still call him and ask him about the goal. And there's a lot of interesting things that would change soon after this game that are evident in this photo. First of all, you can see they're both wearing their dark uniforms. Now, it wasn't a rule until 1951 that teams had to have whites and darks. And can you guess why? The rule came in? TV, right? Television. The Red Wings, that was the first season the Red Wings broadcast games on TV in 1949 50 season. And Hockey Night in Canada started the year after. And they needed a way on black and white television to distinguish one team from the other. Because as you can see, that, I mean, you can tell they're different, but it's awfully close. And if you imagine Montreal and Detroit where they're both wearing red, it would look even closer. So they dictated that. The home team originally wore the whites and the darks were the visitors. They switched it to darks at home and then in 1970 switched it back to whites at home and recently they've switched it back to where the home team wears the dark colors. So they tend to switch it every so many years so people get to see both varieties. But this would have been the last Stanley Cup final where both teams were wearing dark uniforms. And if you look at the referee in the background there, he's wearing a white shirt, he's wearing a shirt and tie. Now, that was another change they made. Once they went to white and dark uniforms, well, you couldn't have the referee in a white sweater because he looked like one of the players on the other team. So if you're watching on TV, you wouldn't be able to pick out the referee, so they came up with the idea of the striped shirts. And that's when the referees started to look like jailbirds. And again, you can see the, the chicken wire behind the net there, and you can even see some lights that were probably there to help the photographers. But as you can see, like we talked about, the chicken wire is only really behind the net. These folks here, the puck's coming in to the zone, they better be paying attention because it might be in their face before you know it. And even, even the chicken wire is only covering part of the fans. The people in the, the second tier, they're wide open to get hit too. So being a fan in those days was an adventure. It was a physical game in those days, and as you can see here, the Bill Gadsby's uh, caught uh, Stan Makita with quite the body check, and uh, Stan's airborne. And uh, Gadsby is an interesting character because, again, because of the television era, I think, people associate him with the Red Wings. But he played 20 years in the NHL, and only five of them with the Red Wings, his last five seasons with the Red Wings. He played. 
the first 15 seasons with the Blackhawks and then the Rangers. And in fact, he came into the NHL the same year as Gordie Howe. And in their rookie seasons, Gadsby still teases Gordie about this, Gadsby finished higher in the Rookie of the Year voting than Gordie did. And Gadsby was in a, quietly a very accomplished defenseman. He was the first NHL defenseman to record 500 career points. He was the first player in NHL history to play 300 games with three different teams. And he was, he and Gordie Howe, when they took the ice for the Red Wings opener in 1965, became the second and third players in NHL history to play in 20 seasons. Did Clapper of Boston being the first. So he accomplished a lot, but the one thing he never accomplished was winning the Stanley Cup. You know, played 20 years in the NHL and never won the Cup and got to the finals only with Detroit. In fact, didn't win a playoff series in 15 years in the NHL until he came to Detroit. So he ended up, he played in the finals in 63, 64, and 66. And in a cruel twist of fate, you probably have heard about the famous Bobby Bond broken leg goal in the 64 playoffs in Detroit in the cup final in overtime when Bond fractured his ankle and came back to play in the overtime and scored the winning goal. And the Wings led the series 3-2, to two, and if they won the game that night, they win the Stanley Cup. And the cruel twist of fate was Bond's shot deflected off Gadsby and over Sawchuk's shoulder. So Gadsby, you know, the, it's like fate didn't want him to win the Stanley Cup. And, uh, he, uh, you know, he's a great player. And in, in fact, in the 66 playoffs, Gadsby, Normie Ullman, and uh, Dean Prentice were all on the Red Wings that year. All of them played at least 20 years in the NHL and none of them ever won the Stanley Cup. I mean, you talk about a hard luck guy. Norm Ullman came up with the Wings in 55-56 when they won for the last time in 42 years. And he got traded to, by Detroit to Toronto in the 67-68 season, the year after the Leafs won the Cup for the most recent time. So he just didn't have good timing. Now we talked about, and we showed you the photo of the Stanley Cup sitting on the table. Uh, and we also talked about that 1950 double overtime game. Well, perhaps it was the emotion of the night, you know, the winning, the Wings were actually in that series down to the Rangers 3-2 to two, and had won game 6-7 and seven to take the Cup. And uh, when the Cup was brought out on the ice, Lindsay went over to the table, scooped it up, and carried it around the ice to show the fans. His, his opinion was they were the reason everybody was here. If they weren't buying tickets, nobody was playing this game. So he felt they were the ones that should see the cup. So he basically started a tradition that carries on today to bring the cup around the ice and show it to everyone. And you know, the whole passing of the cup to the other players and that evolved from that. And I asked Ted, you know, why did you do it? He says, I don't know, he said, it wasn't like I planned it, it was just kind of an impulsive thing. I just saw it there and thought the fans should get a closer look and grabbed it and off he went. So started a famous uh, Stanley Cup tradition right at Olympia Stadium and other, you know, like that predates the octopus. It wasn't until 1952 that they started throwing the octopus on the ice. And I can tell you a funny octopus story. Marcel Pronovo was the guy who picked up the first octopus. He, was t he told me about it. Uh, they threw it on the ice, and one of the linesmen went over, thinking it was some piece of debris or something. And when he saw it, he went, whoa! <laughs> and Marcel said he skated over, and he just hooked it on the end of his stick, carried it over like this, and fired it into the penalty box. And that's how the, the first octopus was removed from the ice. I said, did you know what it was? He said, oh, yeah, I knew it was right away. I said, did you think it was strange? He said, oh, yeah, I didn't know why it was out there, but I knew we had to get rid of it. Well, that's it, folks. That's all the photos I have. Um, I do have the book here if you're interested in purchasing it. Uh, it's $30. I also have uh, Marcel Pronovo's biography, which I wrote with Marcel, and that's $20 if anybody's interested. And if you've got any questions at all, start shooting. I'll take them. All right. Well, thanks very much for coming. And as I said, if you're <laughs> any interest in either of the books, I'd be happy to sign them for you or not sign them for you, whatever you prefer. And if Feel free to come up, and uh, I'll be glad to help you out. And Thank thanks. You Appreciate it. Great job. Thank you.